you all for coming. So, so uh, today we're talking about the future of wireless, and so we're talking about it from the perspective of the handset manufacturer with John from LG and uh, Dave Dobbin from Mobilisi, the carrier, and from the equipment manufacturer, Dave Keekstra from Ericsson. So uh, next slide, please. So Dave is the president and CEO of Mobilicity. He worked as president of Toronto Hydro Telecom, CEO of Telecom Ottawa, and he was named one of Canada's top 40 under 40 in 2006. He's also the founder, former chair, and active supporter of the Toronto Board of Trades Information and Communication Technology Commu Committee and Popular Speaker Program. Next slide, please. Okay, Dave Keekstra, he's the Chief Technology Officer of Ericsson Canada for a customer unit focused on Bell, TELUS, SaskDell, and the new entrants. He's a 20-year veteran of the Canadian wireless industry, and previously he worked as VP of Technology at Huawei focused on LTE deployment at, for AT&T. He also worked for Nortel Networks, leading the Canadian region RF design deployment and optimization services, as well as he was the senior manager of engineering. And John Kennedy, he's currently the vice president of sales and marketing for mobile communications at LG Canada. He grew the LG GSM business fourfold. And right now he drove smartphone share from 10% in the first half or he drove market share to 10% in the first half as the number two Android OEM, and they have the number one single SKU in Canada, the Optimus, LG Optimus One. And previously he worked at RIM, where he commercialized BlackBerry internet services in various sales and marketing roles. And uh, I'm Howard, the founder of Howard Forums. So the first question, is this it? Has the mobile industry hit a point where innovation stops or slows considerably? Sort of how it has with landlines. So uh, John? I'd say uh, the answer is absolutely not. No, I think we've got several years of uh, continuous innovation. We're at a point where it's stalled out a bit and in a bit of litigation between the ecosystems. But I think from a hardware perspective, uh, it's continuing to grow at a very exciting rate. You know, in terms of screens, they're getting brighter, they're getting deeper resolution, and, and much bigger, absolutely. I think we'll absolutely see a five inch display in Android next year uh, from one of the OEMs. And uh, in terms of speeds, we're, you know, we're gonna be LTE in Canada this year. I think it was announced yesterday by another carrier, and, and throughout next year, I'd expect the majority to be on LTE. So. There's not really a, a tipping point yet in terms of, of uh, innovation. I think we're, we're at a point of a, a bit of consolidation, but we're going to break through that. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dave Dobbin? Um, I, think, I think when I look at it from a carrier perspective, in Canada today, uh, wireless competition, you know, if you look at the industry three years ago, there really was no competition. It was slow, it was sleepy. Um, today, the, the, the industry from a carrier perspective is probably the most competitive it ever has been. Uh, I would submit that it's the most competitive in the Western world right now in Canada. And that, by the very nature of that competition, forces uh, innovation, it forces new ways to bundle products, new ways to bundle network, uh, new marketing approaches. So uh, absolutely, and I think innovation on a product level from a mobile carrier is gonna continue to, to go very, very quickly in Canada. You need to be closer? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think um, if you look at the applications, the App Store on, on, on the, on the um, Apple phone and, you know, Android, we've moved applications out of the network provider up into the developer space, much like the internet, where, you know, have thousands of people developing applications. Uh, maybe only one or two really take off and have uh, any traction generally with the public, but you need to have that ecosystem of developers developing ac applications. And that's what's occurred in the last few years, and that will continue. And a lot of innovation is yet to come out of, out of the application development that we haven't seen yet. 
Um, like who would have thought we'd be playing Angry Birds, right? Last year, so um, I, I don't think it's going to stop. Thank you. So, what new features would you like to see in mobile? So, in the past, features like these were added and improved upon. So, you know, maybe seven, eight years ago, we got polyphonic ringtones. Seven years ago, color screens. Then we had mo music playback, cameras, apps. So, what's next? Let me start. Okay. I'll go first because mine's the simplest request. I'd like a battery that lasts. Right here. Sorry, Joe. <laughs> I'd like a battery that lasts too. Um, no, uh, I think, um, again, I go back to apps. I, I sort of see more two way video coming in the, in the future. Be, it's already here. We have some. FaceTime on, on the uh, Apple platforms and Android has you know, Tango um, and, and much other apps, but I think that'll become more pervasive in the future. With more uh, cameras on our phones doing a video call. Yeah, I think that definitely the uh, Apple ecosystem is, is one that's a good model in terms of delivering content, whether it's through the App Store or iTunes. And, and the burden now on us is to really restore kind of the, the ecosystem, right, and shift it back in terms of Android, in terms of other OEMs, the burdens on us is to deliver against these more advanced screens, processors, and technologies. If there's a true HD screen, there's got to be true HD movies being delivered over the network to that device. Today, that's not there, and, and I'd say the challenge is on companies like LG, who's built its business off of deep partnerships with its carrier partners, to create that ecosystem and, the, and that, that hardware content relationship and those dynamic user experiences. And I'd say, you know, in terms of features, if, if we're just scratching, you know, polyphonic ringtones and color screens, you know, there were some things we were showing at CES last year and we're looking to show this coming year in terms of how we integrate connectivity in your whole home. And that's a promise LG hasn't really delivered on. And, and uh, I think we're going there in a big way through technologies like DLNA, as, as Dave has mentioned, through the HDMI cables that kind of gap simple users to kind of understand the concept of playing their video content that's captured and user-generated content. And what we're really seeing is that's really exciting to myself is, you know, the integration of technologies like Digby and Wi-Fi in your home network to allow you to control your electricity consumption of your washers, dryers, the inventory that's sitting in your fridge. You know, it was kind of a, a, a magic fluke that we were the first with that internet fridge that landed at Future Shop for ten thousand uh, dollars. We didn't. I don't know that we sold a lot of them, but we had a lot of buzz and a lot of innovation. And it's, you know, it's not as hard as it was where you had to manually enter each item. With our ThinQ line that we introduced at CES, there's a barcode scanner that integrates with the common databases and the internet has caught up with the vision of our, of our industrial designers. And so there's those types of elements that we're really building and, and the company's much further advanced if you lived in Korea. Right. And you could see a lot more automation in the products we deliver there. Yeah, and that, and that when, when we think of features that I think are, are coming, if we can figure out how to do it right in Canada, our, our payment ecosystem in Canada for mobile payments is very stunted in comparison with other places around, around the world. Um, you know, if you go to uh, Japan or Korea, you're tapping your phone uh, against uh, uh, p uh, machines to pay for things. And in Canada, we're behind, uh, behind with just the proprietary desire of our carriers and our banks to own that payment relationship with people. So you, know, you look at actually in the US, uh, Google Wallet. Has anybody seen, played with Google Wallet yet? It's a staggeringly cool service uh, that would be awesome to roll out in Canada. The problem is that uh, the, the, the release of the customer relationship by Canadian carriers has not yet happened to the extent that a Google Payments will actually work. Um, like Google Payments, you take your Nexus S, you attach it to your MasterCard account, you can walk into convenience stores and tap your Nexus S and pay for your drugs, and pay for your, pay your drug store, you can pay for stuff. It's working today. We don't have anything like that in Canada. Nothing like that at all. It's because you look at the way we think about things, if I'm rambling, tell me. The way we think about things, you know, Zoom Pass, 
the supposed answer to Canadian payments is owned by Bell, Telus, and Rogers. Well, the banks aren't buying that, right? The banks aren't going there because the banks want to own that relationship. So we need to, as an industry, grow up and realize we can't own that customer relationship, we can't own a technology, we can't own an app. It's all over the top stuff and, and we need to enable the consumer. I think the one thing that I absolutely agree with you on, Dave, is that if we can create consumer value and we think about the user experiences, not introducing new switching costs or mental burdens on the user, yeah, right? Like finding a new bank or finding a new relationship, it's, it's just tedious for the user. If we unlock that unobvious customer value and we do it in a natural way and we grow the pie for everyone, there's going to be more for us to all to eat. Well, and that's why, you know, you look at Google Wallet, why it's so brilliant is because it utilizes the existing MasterCard platform uh, to clear the transactions. It uses existing NFC technology uh, in the phone and it uses existing points of sale that are already in retailers. So it's, everything's there. Yeah. Everything's there, everything's easy, it's fast, and it just makes it cool for the consumer. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, well, I guess, what do you think the next big, big thing is? You're talking about mobile payments and being able, using Zigbee and other other technologies like that to control your home. So, I guess, what, what, which, what do you think the next next uh, big feature that's coming is? Ask him, he's got the best answer. <laughs> no pressure. Well, I, you know, I think we've, we've touched on it a bit here, but um, I think the next big thing is anything that that can benefit from a wireless connection. We'll eventually have a wireless connection. So, you know, at Ericsson, we talked about the 50 billion uh, connected devices globally. We're at 5 billion, roughly, right now. Um, we've connected people. Uh, now we're going to connect, you know, machines, basically. And I think that'll happen again through this whole ecosystem of developers where you need innovation you, know, you, need a, you need people to try a thousand things to get the one thing that will work. And even in the mobile payment industry, I think if you go over the top, uh, all the innovation, eventually one will stick and customers will go to it and, and it will become pervasive. And then you have that sort of what we have in this industry we call Metcalf's Law. The value of something is the number of people using it. And uh, you know, we see that in the internet today, the value of Facebook is that everybody uses it. The value of Google is that everybody uses Google, um, and I think that'll happen in, uh, in 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 the future. If that developer community, that level of innovation, uh, we'll get the machine to machine, we'll get the mobile payments, uh, we'll get all these apps that you know the three of us and Howard we we can't imagine because you, you have the collective imagination and innovation of a huge huge community out there that will we'll come up with that. We just have to make sure the phones, the networks, and the carriers are prepared to handle that. Really. I, I think if I could add to that is, you know, another major innovation that the carriers and the OEMs and the network providers have to make and is abstracting the end user from all these technologies, these terms. We have to get back to a mode of storytelling, engaging the consumer in the benefits that really manifest themselves in value for them. And if, to the extent that we can simplify them from DLNA connectivity and dual band Wi-Fi and, and all of those elements that add a lot of value, but really practically apply it as if we were their next door neighbor and not you know, the geek that works for a tech company, uh, they're going to start to adopt these. And that, that's where Dave gets into those positive network externalities and bandwagon effects that really allow us to, to push these technologies out and change the way people live and allow it to, to function a lot better. So what role will you play in the future? So uh, I guess for, for Dave Dobbin, how important a role will carriers play in the future? Well, I, I have a, a different view on this than the rest of the Canadian wireless industry. Um, I, I think that the wireless carrier uh, of the future becomes a pipe and becomes a, a conduit for over-the-top services, content devices, whatever, uh, that the consumer will use. Um, as, as hard as we try in the industry to, to hang on to that consumer relationship and add value to that consumer relationship, I just, I just, I do not have the intellectual horsepower to figure out how to beat Google. 
I, I just I can't figure that out. And I, I, I cannot figure out how to beat the 50,000 developers that are all working on the next app. So the carrier just needs to provide uh, a, a good quality uh, pipe for the consumer to enable all these other services uh, to, tra to transit over. You know, we get pitches all the time for uh, just the craziest ideas. You know, I, I had one in, I, you know, I got this question the other day and I had, I had a group come in the other day to me and pitch uh, developing an app store. You guys should have a mobilist app store where people can get apps for your phones and all these sorts of things. And I, I looked at the guy and I said, are you nuts? Like, wh how, why would I rebuild the Android market? Like, this just doesn't make any sense to me. Why would I rebuild BlackBerry app? Like, it just, it makes no sense to do this. What I can do is provide a pipe for consumers to access that at a great price. So that's great. I think, though, the real value you and OEMs make, and this is the commonality and the reason LG has been so successful, is that we deeply uh, partner with our carriers, right? We've gone through highs and lows. We survived crises in the past, you know, the first crises being that of the Nokia bar phone, right, where it kind of undercut the whole market and put us in a very dangerous position. We survived the Motorola Razor and came back with thinner, tighter offerings like the chocolate phone. We've survived the uh, Apple iPhone and the Blackberry and we've come back with the Optimus One and now the 3D and many other leading super phones. And so the value we offer is that tight collaboration with our partners, understanding what creates value for them and the end consumer. And our brand is a promise. Our brand together is a promise. Your brand is that you don't have an ego, you're not getting in the way, you're just allowing people access and, and you're not imposing some hidden agenda. That's the Mobilicity brand as I kind of read it. And my brand is, is really about future technologies fused with hip, cool design that makes your life better. It's a life's good experience and I think that our that's really, at the end of the day, what we need to really continue to invest in because consumers are buying that promise that we make to them every day with every product. And, and the investments we make have to continue to deliver on that. Yeah, but the carrier, uh, you know, the carrier differentiation in the ecosystem is, I think, going to be very important in that, you know, at Mobilisti, we offer a good wireless service at a massive discount to the incumbents, right? It's like a 70, 75% discount to what the incumbents offer. Um, the incumbents are launching LTE, you know it's gonna cost more money than our service. So there's there's the role the carrier plays. Right? Is we provide a good service at a great price, some consumers want that. Some consumers want ultra ultra fast, the other guys will provide that, right? And that's 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 the role that, that the carrier plays. How about equipment manufacturing? Well, I think what the uh, the stress on the equipment manufacturer will be is we have to abstract the network away from the service, basically, and you know create platforms that mo mobile carriers can adapt to this ecosystem of apps and and, and new developments on uh, services and and uh, machine to machine. So you know, I think. What the the equipment manufacturers have to do is, is figure a way to you know create that abstraction layer and enable the scale from, for for uh, the carriers to add all these services, add all these touch points, uh, put out all this uh, you know devices and, and you know what um, John was talking about with all the the uh, you know TVs and, and, and in home stuff where you've got a lot more attaching to the network, there's a lot lot more devices attaching to the network, a lot more sessions, a lot more um, you know data being transferred, just subscriber or attachment data. And I think what the, the vendors have to do, the infrastructure vendors, is have to allow the carriers to be able to scale, scale efficiently, scale economically, to handle all that and not impose upon the carriers restrictions on what kind of services and, and, uh, and applications they could develop. As the applications come out, they have to have that freedom to be able to turn around quickly to put that application on their network. And so the equipment manufacturers can't be imposing that kind of, any restrictions on you in that area. And, that, and, and that's, that's a challenge for the equipment manufacturer because the licensing model and the hardware model from the telecom infrastructure world 
in wireless is very different than the, the, the infrastructure is very different than the IP world. And you know, when you look at wireless, you're still buying licenses for every level, you're buying pieces of hardware for every level, whereas in the IP world, you buy a router. And the router does everything. You buy a router based on size rather than on licensing. And that's a big challenge for the equipment manufacturers to get their heads around this IP world because traffic grows so quickly and sessions grow so quickly and everything scales so fast that the licensing model needs to change. Well, they've already touched on this. Will carriers eventually become dumb pipes? So, um, so I, I guess you already said that. Dave's my customer, so I agree with him. <laughs> so, um, so will, so does that mean you're going to get out of the minutes business eventually? You, you know what? I would love to be out of the minutes business tomorrow. Right? I would love to be out of the minutes business because, you know, a, a, a you know a VoIP solution is actually less intensive on the network solution than a stand, uh, the network infrastructure than a standard circuit switch call. It's easier to do for us. So, I mean, if, if we could just get everybody onto a VoIP solution and dealing with Skype or whoever, for the, for the carrier, that's a good thing because it decreases the load in the back end. The problem is people love dial tone. People love to have that ability to dial easily without setting up and customizing software. It's not easy yet. So, um, so I guess in Canada, the carriers try to be the face of the mobile industry. So, so this, you think this will downplay their importance? Well, yeah, and I mean, you, you know, show of hands in the room, you know, do you want to have a relationship with Apple, Google, and and Netflix and all those guys, or would you rather have a relationship completely all in with Rogers? Who would rather have a 100% Rogers relationship than deal with Android on their own? No hands in the audience. Point made. So, uh, John, will phone manufacturers eventually only compete on price? I Absolutely mean, not. <laughs> no, we, you know, our investments have to be, as I said, in that brand, in that promise, in a differentiated experience. If we compete only on price, labor costs are not cheaper in Korea, right? Uh, we're going to be in a no-win situation, so we have to create those elements that make it fun and invigorate, right? This is where Apple's done a great job on their brand, and they command 40% gross margin. Maybe you should, they should be asked for to take less margin, right? But, you know, if we compete just on components, there's no sense being in this space. We have to add value through, you know, the consistency of the support experience, the the ability to have a no hassle return policy. And that's something that, you know, Dave's company made forefront when we launched our first product with them, the Wink, right? You know, I looked at his terms and I go, this is crazy, this won't work, it's it's too expensive. But then we started to see it work and, and it was manifesting itself in reorders and it, it involved us taking a risk with each other, right? Learning to dance with each other and understand the unique value that they were bringing to the market. And you know, with using and leveraging those two brands, uh, we created trust for a new carrier to start to get off the ground and start to find their voice in the marketplace and use the brand of LG to get that initial credibility and hardware trust right? that other manufacturers may not bring to the table. So we need to continue to deliver that differentiation for our consumers. I, I, I can give you a perfect example of I can give you a perfect example of, of phone manufacturers competing on way more than price. It is John's LG phone, the manufacturing quality, the weight of it, the components, all those sorts of things, and my BlackBerry 9780, right? My BlackBerry's processor isn't even close to the speed of the processor on, on his phone. My BlackBerry doesn't have the features that his phone does. It doesn't have the, the uh, you know, the, the inherent uh, uh, build uh, density that the LG does, just just you know features per square centimeter. It's not even close. But BlackBerry commands a price premium over the, over John's device because of the service that BlackBerry provides and what they do. So perfect example right here at the table. But it's much harder if you use a platform that everyone else uses, like Android. And I think you're, you're touching on a key concern for everyone right now. Anybody in the Android uh, OEM space 
has to be a little cautious right now, right? They just acquired a hand hardware manufacturer potentially for more than just patents, right? And uh, I think that's why it's in our best interest to have two very strong OEM relationships, and that's the path that LG has chosen. Uh, we've uh, developed Windows Phone 7 devices, and we continue to work with Microsoft here locally, and they're a great partner. Uh, I, we wish them great luck, and we continue to invest even with our uh, existing Optimus 7 phone in reinvigorating that with the Mango release that we're, we're going to be announcing shortly. And I would say that with Android, it's the hot platform, it's got great momentum, and, and we're really showcasing our hottest new technologies in terms of processor and brightest displays in the market where you can read them in, in direct sunlight. But, uh, you know, you've got to have uh, two outs if you're a poker player, right? You leave, your, you leave yourself ways to win the hand even if your initial strategy of a straight or a flush goes down the, down the chute, you've got another way to continue that hand. And, and we're not all in on any one option there. We've got to leave our doors open and differentiate on what we do, which is build quality, industrial design, and style, right? Another Prada phone could be a complete possibility because that is abstracted from the OS, right? And it creates a lot of value for the fashionistas and style conscious in our audience and there's no high-level elite brand in the Superphone marketplace right now. That's not an official comment. I, I think for the handsets, though, similar to what I said for the equipment manufacturers, the handsets have to get out of the way of this 50,000 developer community creating apps. I think if a handset manufacturer imposes any kind of restriction on that developer community, that handset manufacturer will eventually lose because I think that's the game we're in. Dave, I think I 100% I agree with you, and that's where LG shone in our smartphone development. We were the first ones to have unlocked bootloaders, right? That's not something you put your shoes on with. That's how you mod your super phone, right? The the Optimus 2X was the original hacker phone in these dual core phones because it allowed you to take popular modifications like Cyanogen mod, and before Gingerbread's available tweak out your phone, right? You don't need to be on the Nexus device if you have an unlocked bootloader and you can go to Cyanogen and get the latest firmware. We don't recommend that you tweak your devices, but there's a community that really enjoys that experience. It's not an official LG comment, again. So will network speeds eventually stop increase, increasing? So, uh... You know, uh, earlier on in my career, when I was a little thinner and less gray hair, we thought one megabits per second, nobody would ever use that. And here we are, you know, people are talking about having 3D HD TV in their homes, the whole DLNA thing going on, and, and, and now we're talking that 100 megabits per second is not going to be enough going to a person's home. So for some reason, uh, we always find a way to fill the pipe, and we always find a need to have faster speeds. So, in my view, is you know this this will keep going, and you know equipment manufacturers always want the uh, the operators to keep buying more equipment for faster speeds anyway, right? So, on both ends. Thanks, Dave. Trust me. So uh, what obstacles do you see going forward? Does everyone being connected present a security risk we're not aware of? Uh, from an OEM side, absolutely. You know, I, I'm a strong proponent of really securing your solution, whether it's your Android mobile phone, getting a solution like F-Secure or Kaspersky Mobile. Uh, you know, your identity is on those phones, right? All of your personal contacts, all your business contacts. You know, I was talking with the uh, one of the leading security manufacturers yesterday about uh, preloading on our phones and, and the value that that creates for the end user, and they, they, they kind of showed me a feature that they nicknamed the Tiger Woods feature, right, and, and how they could secure all your text messages in private mode. I, I think, it, you know, there's multiple reasons for why you want this on a phone, but you don't want your phone and your, your contacts and your emails easily accessible. And the core uh, security and, and encryption on Android is almost non-existent. The swipe patterns, you could see my swipe pattern by just looking at it in sunlight. 
right? So you need that extra layer of security on your device and you're exposing yourself to identity fraud, you're exposing yourself to uh, unwanted marital problems, you're exposing yourself to a lot of things. Unless you're a clean cut guy like me and Dave. I, I think that uh, the security industry, the cyber security industry is a good industry to invest in right now. So in the beginning, we had telegraph, then we had phones, mobile phones. Now we have connected tablets, computers, and cars. So what's next to get connected? Well, I, I think Dave uh, hit on it with his earlier comment. And you know, I, I'm a big believer in Ericsson's 50 million connected to, or 50 billion connected devices theory. There's there's a lot of devices that could benefit from being connected to a network in some way, shape, or form. Um, you know, I don't know about the fridge, maybe, but you know, uh, here's one that I think is immediate and, and would be brilliant is uh, a SIM in your car. Right? I think that'd be great. Put a SIM in the car. Uh, internet radio comes over the car now. Uh, calls are easier. That's a great, a great thing. Um, you know, the uh, smart metering and the way that's connected. We've started with electricity, but there's real uh, opportunities for conservation in water and all other gas and all other sorts of uh, places that connected devices make uh, sense. So more and more devices are going to get connected. You're going to see it uh, sprouting everywhere. Uh, uh, you know, this is just going to get bigger and bigger. Things. I think another one that you know we we haven't really touched on that's going to get connected and is in the infancy right now is your TV and the TV viewing experience, right? It's going from very passive media and the, the first attempts to commercialize smart TV uh, largely had flopped. And I think it's because they felt like people wanted to be really interactive with their television and they wanted to be tweeting or, or kind of doing a live spill on their Facebook with all of their friends. And that was kind of the wrong approach. They had to look at it from a 10 feet experience. And uh, that's where if you look at our smart TV upgrader or the latest versions of our 3D TVs, they all have that connectivity, but it's in a passive experience, a 10 foot experience where we've integrated with the best applications like NFL for the Sunday ticket or NBA or MLB, but instead of like the traditional packages you'd purchase where you get only one viewing angle, we can offer multiple viewing angles, integration with athletes' live spills, a full uh, app store that allows you to customize your TV experience so that it becomes your window to the internet upon those circumstances where a big screen is necessary, like getting your weather, getting your update, or morning briefing, uh, and the small screen just doesn't cut it. So we have to look at the ways in which we create that value, and I think the next is in that connectedness, where is the hub, and I think the hub of a, of a person's existence is their mobile phone. You check your phone over 200 times a day, right? Looking for texts, tweets, updates, uh, statuses. It's, it's your source of enjoyment, inspiration. It's your connection to people, friends, family, and all of your other relationships. And that's what allows you to extend your being into those other devo devices where you can optimize the experience to a bigger screen or a smaller screen. Uh, what about what about a like a connected pacemaker or something or? Well, yeah, I think you know when we talk about the medical industry or or government or uh, manufacturing industries, there's a ton of applications out there that could could uh, benefit from being connected to uh, a to to a network or, or a mobile network or a landline network. Again, I I think. The developer community will will figure that out, and you know it's always a question that there's a lot of science fair experiments that happen. Um, a lot of science fair experiments have to happen for the ones that will actually take off and, and uh, become pervasive in a real product. So yeah, I think you know connected pacemakers or or, or people being monitored remotely for for health, like even their heart rates or their medicine, all that kind of stuff is a possibility. Right now, it's still stuck in science fair mode, but again, as applications get developed, as interfaces become easier, um, as applications become less tied to network configurations, uh, I think you'll see a lot of these things take off.
I think this one that's especially pertinent is the investments in the healthcare industry for LG particularly have more than tripled. Uh, we really focused initially in Canada in partnering with the uh, University of Calgary in Alberta and have delivered uh, you know, uh, functions around daisy chaining Bluetooth devices with phones that allow you to do your glucose readings for diabetes patients and have the information passed real time back to their uh, practitioner. I think that you know, as you look at it from that perspective, uh, you know, Dave makes a really good point in that you know, there's things that we can put a SIM in and, and things that we can add a lot more value. Um, and the, the thing that really gives me a lot of courage and optimism is the egoless approach that you've taken to kind of bringing that to the forefront in, in that you don't have to develop uh, strategies where this phone cannot be the hub to enable all of those uh, applications requiring subscribers to get five, six, seven different plans from you. You enable it from one connection and that's what makes sense to the consumer. They say, I have my TV at home I want to bring it with me on this small device. Why? Why is that a second subscription? That's why in the U.S., uh, media flow never took off. Why do I have to pay five bucks for crappy stream video when I've got HD TV sitting in my house? Why can't I bring that PVR experience with me? The one thing I will say, Howard, is don't put a chip in me to track me or let anybody know where I am. That freaks me out. I, I won't tell you if that happens. That that totally freaks me out. So uh, elsewhere, <clears throat> in some countries they've skipped having landlines for phones and internet access and they've jumped straight to cell phones. So how do you think this will change their perceptions of the future of mobile compared to here? But countries that don't have landline typically are countries that it's very difficult to build landline infrastructure in or expensive, cost prohibitive, not affordable. Uh, I've built a lot of landline infrastructure. So when you go to sub-Saharan Africa, they just, they just can't afford to build a landline infrastructure, so mobile makes a whole lot of sense. Um, in, in a country like Canada or the United States or you know, Western Europe where we're uh, you know, first world countries, there will always be a need for a landline service into your house because the, as Dave was talking about, the nature of the content that gets delivered into the house, the amount of bandwidth being delivered into the house, the amount of transport needed to get into the house demands a landline, and it always will. And you know, fiber optic cable will always carry more capacity than a wireless network. Always, always, always. The laws of physics are immutable. You will need landline infrastructure. Now, again, in sub-Saharan Africa, they're not worried about four HD, four uncompressed HD TV screens in a house with you know internet access at 100 meg and all this technology going on. They don't care. So mobile only makes a whole lot of sense. But you can't watch you know four HD TV screens over a wireless connection. You can't do. It. And I think if you're talking about you know the anthropological or, or sociological uh, impacts and how people interact with each other. Technology doesn't change how you communicate or interact with people. You are the center of that. And I, I really learned this in my early years at Research in Motion. I'd go selling to some of the biggest Fortune 500 customers and executives would say, well, I don't, I don't want one of these phones because then the company can always get me. Well, if, if you're weak and you're, you allow your phone or your technology to be your dog leash, you've, you already have given up your own autonomy, right? If you view this as a tool for empowerment and it's your way to get access to resources and stay in touch with people, then that's the way that it's gonna have an impact. And I think the, some of the research we've done in, into the sociological effects of technology is how can we enable those types of communities of interests and those groups and that, that user-generated content that creates value for you. So, you know, one of the phenomena that we really studied was uh, the German uh, concept of Café Kletsch, right? Where kind of at the 2 p.m. hour, we all get together, we go down to the local café and we have our uh, short espresso or coffee and we're talking about gossip, right? What's going on with your family and the relationships? The technology shouldn't contextualize the discussion, it should add value and color to it. And, and that's really where we try to draw our inspiration from, is those unobvious insights that allow you to enhance existing modes of communication, not to create a new dynamic. 
I, I think in these countries that have done mobile only, uh, the mobile phone network becomes a growth engine for that economy. And, uh, you know, a lot more, I think that they will probably d develop a lot more transactional, uh, personal transactional uh, tools and apps, like banking, you know, credit cards, banking, all that, quicker than North America will. As Dave was talking about, you know, in Canada, we're not really pushing that here yet. I don't think there's really even a consumer demand. We still like going to banks and using bank cards, right? But uh, in those countries, that'll be their bank card, that'll be their credit card. And so those are places where a lot of that transactional stuff will develop quicker than North America. So the landline is almost like a crutch. What's that? The landline is almost like a crutch then. Well, I think in, in, in North America, like, like we were saying before, we want 4D, you know, uh, or 3D, 4D. The, the, the back time, in time. The, the back in time television will come out next. But we want 3D TV and we want it in our kids' rooms and we want to be able to throw stuff from our phone to the TV and, and you know, we're going to want holographic TV probably in 20 years. Uh, so if, you can, if you're in a, in a mature economy, you're always going to need fiber to the home. So, you know, the landline industry is not going to go away in North America. But in these, in these countries, if the mobility network creates a good economy, you're going to have sections there where people will have 3D TV in the future as well. Like look at China, um, you know, 20 years ago, they didn't have any communications. Now they're probably more sophisticated than we are. So uh, I think that's uh, there's always going to be a need for fiber. And plus, you've got to connect base stations by fiber anyway. So what do you think? What do you think if I said the, that a mobile phone is a necessity and the government should make sure that everyone has one? I'd say you were a communist. So if it's LG, I'm fine with that. So, <laughs> I mean, if you're implying that it should be free to everyone, that's one, I agree with the communist thing. If you're implying that the idea of universality, which exists on the landline today, where operators have to provide service in certain areas, uh, you know, even a small town in the middle of nowhere, um, that's probably another question. That's a, a debate. The question is who pays for it. Yeah, and uh, is it public money that pays for it, like in Australia, where they're building the network, or uh, do you let market forces? You know, the problem with Canada, some of these small places, market forces will never build a site there. So you know, it, it becomes a question of do we use public money to expand the uh, the mobile coverage to all these small places in rural Canada? I, I think when I think about it. Um, now, I'm from Western Canada, so I'm a libertarian, and I think that less government's better, and the less the government does for me, the happier that I am. So I want the government to make sure there's a road. I want the government to make sure that I get health care at a reasonable cost, and I want the government to make sure that we're not invaded and that nobody kills me. That's what I want the government to do, nothing else. But uh, a mobile phone, it's, it's almost a necessity now. And you know, it, it really, it can really improve your life. Or, and, and you know, you get into this with the, the whole universal service uh, argument. That's what Dave's talking about. It. You know, I come from a town uh, called Trier in Manitoba, population 300. There's nobody there. Um, you know, should uh, a mobile carrier be forced to build uh, infrastructure in Trier in Manitoba to support 150 megabit per second LTE to every user who happens to go through there? Okay, maybe, but. Do you want to pay for that? That's the big question, is do, do people in downtown Toronto want to subsidize people that have made the decision to live in Churchill, Manitoba, to get that technology? Do, do we all want to subsidize that? That's a, that's a big question. Now, I understand you know, we, have a, we, you know, we live in a social democratic country, and it's great. I think it's awesome, but you know, we're already one of the highest tax nations in the world. So, uh, any questions? Hi, um, 
I have two questions, but I'll let him take his question before my second one. Um, my question is related to the carriers, and um, earlier you talked about, Dave, about the competition, uh, which, and it's great that we finally have some good competition uh, with some new entrants, and I congratulate Mobilicity for making the, taking the risk uh, in introducing that no-nonsense service. Uh, my question is related to people who, uh, small business owners, uh, a lot of people who want to move to that one of these new entrants want that no nonsense. Don't want the three-year commitment and all the BS that goes along with that. Uh, but they're they're uh, afraid uh, because of uh, the risk of the, the reliability issues. The other companies have had years to build infrastructure and towers and things like that. And uh, my perception, what I hear, what I see, what I read it in the Howard forums and other places, is people who are frustrated because. They, have, they, they can't get their phone service in their basement or uh, their dead spots and things like that. So can you speak to that in regards to the industry as a whole and also the specific paper mobilicity? So let me, let me talk specifically to the coverage issue you raised. You know, the thing about uh, coverage issues is um, people, uh, you know, the people that have, we very rarely get people phoning, phoning us, writing, or you know, commenting anywhere saying, my phone works everywhere I go, I'm super happy, right? It just never happens. Um, you know, we've got a, a couple hundred thousand customers that uh, you know, have the service, and we, you know, we've got customers that have been on since May of, of last year and have paid their bill every month. So the ones that you hear talking about coverage are generally the ones that have the coverage issue. And that's the trade-off that we live with as a carrier every day is we offer an incredibly low price. Right? I mean, I think everybody in the room would agree that we offer a fantastic price for our service. The trade-off for us offering that fantastic certain low price is that our service uh, is not ubiquitous. Right? It's it's a it's a it's a discounted service. It doesn't work everywhere. I got a tweet the other day where somebody was asking me uh, or saying that Mobilisti should um, uh, take ourselves to Rogers coverage levels, introduce LTE, and keep our price the same. And there's just laws of economics that prevent us from, from doing that. So, you know, we have a lot of customers that are small businesses, a lot of customers that actually use our service every day. Um, you know, my recommendation to the, the small business is we try it. If it works, sign up. The bigger issue we have in our business model with small business is the difference between capital cost and, op and operating cost on the business. Um, small businesses like operating costs. They like a monthly bill, so when you go to them and you sell them a, a, a BlackBerry for zero dollars, they like that because, you know, even though they're paying a hundred dollars a month rather than our forty dollars a month, um, to them it's a smaller sting up front. So we're working through ways on, on how we can blunt that sting for small businesses. We haven't found the answer yet because what people love about us is we're no contract, no credit check. So it's a real Rubik's Cube that we're working through. Does that answer your question? Hi, thanks for taking my question. My name is Alex from Mobile Mystery. We manage mobile for big corporations. It seems that all the phone manufacturers are focused on consumers with all the apps and the Facebook and the Twitter, uh, and BlackBerry is the only one that's focused on businesses. I wanted to know what your brands are doing to focus more on uh, engaging the corporations and uh, as well should more be done uh, with them. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh, I spent you know, three months in Korea last year leading a team focused on enterprise solutions. And I spend a long part of my career at Research in Motion selling the Bez, selling the whole solution. So I understand RIM's position and I understand LG's position. And I think that really it comes down to what David was talking about earlier. Number one is your identity. Who are you? And you have to be true to that for your consumers because it reestablishes and reaffirms what your brand is. If you try and be everything to everyone, you fail. Right? If you try and really focus in on your target market and execute that differentiated experience in a meaningful way, you succeed. LG by and large is a consumer brand and uh, when we did the research we found that there's ways to enable enterprise without changing the focus of our organization and that's, that's really partner driven. Right? And that's where we take our core Android experience, where it's the greatest hardware technology, partnering with companies like IBM or VMware, 
to deliver an MDM, uh, robust MDM solution that uh, rivals the BlackBerry experience in terms of encryption, in terms of data segregation, in terms of true push uh, experience and allows you as a security and, and uh, uh, enterprise-minded individual to create the BlackBerry solution through that partner network. It's not one-stop shopping like BlackBerry is, and that's a very defined value for the business segment, but it allows them to cobble the same value at, uh, at a similar or less expensive price than, than Research in Motion solution. Yeah, I think what, what REM did well was it made a consumer product for the business community. And that's really the issue, I think, with all handsets and, and applications is you know, the, business, the business community and communications, especially wireless, you go back 20 years, everything was a custom developed uh, on, a, on its own frequency and handsets were $5,000 each. Um, the REM thing was, made a device for the business community that was a consumer device and had consumer volume and consumer pricing. And uh, so I think the Android uh, and the apps developers out there, you know, they've started with consumers. I mean, Angry Birds isn't something that you're going to use in your, in your corporate office, but there will come out applications for businesses that you can use on a LG device and, uh, it, and it comes down to Metcalf's law. The more people that use it, then it'll become uh, more per pervasive in, in, in the business community. That's, what, that's RIM selling point right now, is everybody's using a RIM, and that's why they're valuable. Um, will that change, or will RIM manage to keep that going? I mean, that's the big question. I, I think the question's been answered, that it's largely changing. They, they've lost the tablet market. The, the playbook was not a successful venture. That's very established and it really, corporations are buying iPads in the thousands uh, of units a day. I think that in terms of the hardware, the, the solution is there today for email. It's called Exchange Active Sync, and it's very clearly as secure a methodology as BlackBerry's email. It comes down to then what they do in the MDS for data subscribers, and that's where you would then have to link in with a Tivoli server or another MDM solution. And, and so it's there. It's just what RIM did phenomenally well is they had great focus on that business market, which was the CTO and the line of business leadership and creating the story for them that I talked about earlier, telling and abstracting the users from the difficulties of wireless so that the job enhances their function, which very certainly was giving you an hour of productivity back in your day. And so for the, the Android manufacturers, the Windows Phone 7 manufacturers, it's a matter of priority. And I think that we're allowing the business market to be satisfied through the developer community and network. We, we sell a lot of phones and um, you know, what RIM has done really well is they've created uh, uh, fanatics and loyalists, right? In that when you go into one of our stores, a BlackBerry user is buying a BlackBerry. That's what happens, right? They're coming into the store, you're not selling them anything else, they're buying a BlackBerry. A consumer who's had a Nokia or an LG or a Samsung, they can move around other products and they'll buy other phones, but a BlackBerry user buys a BlackBerry and RIM's done really well at that. They've done great at that. I think this is the, um, we only have time for one more question. I have the next question. Okay, this is more for the, this is more for Dave, Darwin, and John. What is preventing consumers from being able to shop for phones and services separately? So, like I see them all in Hong Kong, you have a bunch of stores just selling phones and then there are carriers with their stores who sell services. Why is it not the norm in Canada? And Sir, can I ask you to speak cl more closely to the mic? I can't hear you. Okay, let's try this again. What is preventing consumers from being able to shop for phones and services separately? For example, Pacific Mall have tons of stores that sell just phones, and, and also in Hong Kong. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, on my phone. If I could get out of the handset business tomorrow, I'd do it, right? I would love to sell SIM only, it'd be great. Problem is, the consumer, the vast majority of consumers want to buy the phone and the service together, right? It, it's just the way we've been conditioned in Canada. Um, like, 
trust me, handsets in our business, like I love John a lot, but like the logistics involved with them, the reverse logistics, the shipping, the warranty, I mean, it's an incredible, it's the most complex part of our business. It, it makes his stuff look easy, right? Subsidies, it's craziness. So yeah, I would love to get that business model, but the Canadian consumer, wants to buy that that package uh, service the vast majority of them now i know we have a lot of people in this room that are incredibly technically savvy and love lock love unlocked phones and and, and boot, unlock bootloaders and modding phones and all that sort of stuff i love all of you very much you are a minuscule fraction of the of, of the population right most people want to buy phone and service that's what and I agree with Dave. Most people are that market, and that's the market that's made LG strong. If you look at our market share in operator-led countries, like North America with Canada and the US, where it's you sign up for a two or a three year agreement and you have a contract, that's where LG has dominant market share. We're in usually the high teens or early 20s of market share. And that's through collaborative marketing. That's through creating service value with the, with the carrier and driving uh, the logistics that cause us both headaches but create value for the user. If you drop your phone and you've got problems, we saw what happened with Nexus One. Does, does Google have a phone number for you to call? Is there anyone to help you with your connectivity problem? No. And you guys can figure it out. But the majority of people, do you wanna, do you wanna give your mother and father that device? Because I know you're probably their tech support. And you don't wanna take that first, second, or third tier level support of call from your family when they can't figure out their unlocked phone. And if you buy it and it's from a different frequency because you bought a European phone, and you drop frequently, you know, that, that's a liability on yourself and a support burden. So I think that that largely gets missed. The benefits that the carriers bring to the equation in terms of call center support, quality of service, testing, certification, and, and, and the, the authentication on their network is a great value that they bring to the equation and the collaborative marketing of telling the story so that you can adopt and buy those technologies. We, we have, we have 30 people in our call center, I mean, we're a small carrier right now. We have 30 people in the call center that do nothing but technical support all day. What do you think the number one question they get is? Number one question, with a bullet, my email's not working, how do I set it up? Well, we don't sell email, right? This is unlocked phone world, right? This is where we, we provide a value because we've sold them the phone. We need to know the operating system. Our people need to be trained. So that's, that's what the consumer wants. It's, it's like when you've got uh, you know, a, a cast where there's no lead actor. Nobody steps up to take the responsibility for the performance. In this environment, the carrier steps up and gives you that value, right? I think a lot of people really genuinely care about getting that support, getting that experience, and having an ease of use in their experience. And it's hard to really quantify what's that, what that's worth. The market dictates that. It's expensive for you. It's expensive for us. Okay, so uh, that's the end of the round table.